I was in Eastern Europe in 1989, covering the revolutions, as I mentioned. Uh, I was acutely aware that uh, assurances were given to Gorbachev that NATO would not be expanded beyond the unified borders of Germany. Uh, in fact, of course, we all thought NATO had been rendered obsolete. NATO was ostensibly formed, uh, I believe, in 1948 uh, to halt, or 49, I can't remember, to halt uh, Soviet expansion into Central and Eastern Europe. Um, it shows you how naive we were, that peace dividend and everything else. And then there was a long, uh, over many years, provocation. I mean, I think there's now 14 countries in NATO. There's no, the only reason you do it is, uh, I, I, I think one, uh, to enrich the arms industry because you convert uh, uh, Soviet bloc military equipment to be compatible with NATO equipment. That's uh, and then, of course, I think the United States, Washington saw uh, after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union that they were prostrate and could really do what they want. Uh, so there's no question that Russia was provoked. Uh, I don't think it's a military operation. I think it's a criminal war of aggression. I mean, under post Nuremberg laws, uh, when you and of course, it's what we did in Iraq, which was a criminal war of aggression with probably even less raison d'etre than Moscow has. I mean, uh, Moscow was clearly baited, but in the end they pulled the trigger, which in many ways is what people in Washington wanted. Uh, uh, so that historical process, I mean, Clinton had promised Moscow with the expansion of NATO that there wouldn't be the station of NATO troops in these countries. I mean, uh, and now I think there's 100,000. Uh, there's a missile base in Poland that's about 100 miles. Uh, from the Russian border. I mean, if this would happen to the United States, we would all be apoplectic uh, along the borders of Mexico or Canada or anywhere else. So uh, I, I don't defend the war. I've been very critical of the war itself, uh, but I've also been critical of the arms shipments uh, that have gone into Ukraine because this is fueling a conflict, uh, which is what they want. They want to lure, or they effectively have, I think, lured Russia into the Ukraine, and then you get a long war of attrition, uh, which is going to destroy, the people are going to bleed, or the Ukrainians, I mean, it'll destroy Ukraine, uh, but it will weaken Russia, that the goal, this is the goal, in the same way that Russia, or the old Soviet Union, was weakened by the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. That's, that's what's happening, that's why we're seeing such staggering uh, figures, and uh, the United States now is $55 billion worth of weaponry and assistance, that's $130 million a day. Uh, and then you've got Germany uh, talking about, uh, it already, I think, has doubled its defense budget. Now it's going to be 2% of GDP, which will make Germany the third largest military power in the world uh, after uh, the United States and China. Uh, Russian military, by the way, is pretty small. But these neocons who are in the Biden administration, uh, they have long uh, uh, kind of stoked conflicts with both Russia and China for endless and perpetual war. It feeds the militarists, the, the Pentagon. Uh, we spend more <coughs> on uh, our military than the next nine countries combined, including Russia and China. Uh, and, uh, and of course, it's hollowing the country. There are domestic uh, costs to that because it's hollowing the country out from the inside. Our infrastructure, our, we don't have any high-speed trains and the trains we do have. I mean, I take the train often on the Northeast Corridor between New York and Washington. You can't have a so whole section of the track. You can't even walk down the aisle because it's not even. It's constantly breaking down and uh, the roads, the bridges, and then the social programs and uh, so, uh, it, 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 we really, the government in both Republican and Democrat have been captured by these really nefarious forces, uh, embodied in figures like Victoria Nuland. Victoria Nuland works in the Biden administration. She used to be Cheney's, Dick Cheney's uh, chief foreign policy advisor. Uh, there's a, the State Department, Blinken is another one. Uh, these people have long advocated this very aggressive posture, and I think it comes from the fact that. China is overtaking the United States in terms of an economic powerhouse, uh, and uh, the U.S. just can't let go of this, uh, uh, you know, kind of divine 
uh, right they feel they have for global hegemony and the only instrument they have left to try and uh, exercise that hegemony is, is the military, which is why you see provocations in the South China Sea, uh, uh, why you see uh, the, you know, uh, alliance with Taiwan. I mean, it's really a dangerous situation, and, and they're very cavalier about the fact that they are challenging nuclear states. I mean, the, the Robert Kagan, who's one of these neocons, just wrote a piece in foreign, I think it was foreign affairs, saying, well, don't worry, Putin won't use the bomb. Uh, it, it's it's just uh, these, you know, they're Dr. Strangeloves. They've been with us for a very long time. I dealt with them in, all the way back in Central America in the 80s because I covered the war in El Salvador. Kagan was working with Elliot Abrams in the State Department, and their whole job was to discredit everything we as reporters were reporting in countries like Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, or anywhere else. Uh, and, and it's a non-reality based belief system. It's uh, you know, it's a very simplistic, almost childish view of the world. Everybody they fight is the new Hitler, whether it's Saddam Hussein or Putin. Uh, you know, any kind of diplomacy is the Munich moment uh, of appeasement. It, it's, uh, it, but of course, they stay where they are and they have the power they have because they're funded by the arms industry, all their think tanks, and that's why they're always on TV. I mean, on the Middle East, I have far more experience than they do in the Middle East. As I said, I spent seven years there as a reporter. Uh, and, but but because, uh, and I'm culturally, linguistically, historically literate, I also know war far better than they do, uh, but because I don't uh, parrot back the dominant narrative, voices like mine are shut out. Do you see Russia surpassing the United States in the Western world after this conflict uh, comes to an end because if we look at the sanctions that have been placed on Russia, they have really backfired. And this especially happened when Russian President Vladimir Putin made the decision to sell Russian gas against rubles. This really increased the value of the ruble against the US dollar and also the euro. So, what are the implications looking ahead when it comes to the economy? Well, the Russian economy isn't that strong. It's, it's rich in natural resources, but it's not rich in manufacturing. But what you've done is build an alliance with China. Now, which again, I mean, the entire Cold War uh, effort by the West was to avoid an alliance with China and Russia to, to maintain that Sino-Soviet split. So um, uh, ironically, what, what they've done, I think that's why figures like Kissinger have been so critical of what's happening in Ukraine, is you built an alliance. You built an alliance with a country like Russia, which is rich in natural resources, and then which China needs, and 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 then China, which is now rapidly becoming the dominant manufacturing center in the globe. Which we also mentioned India. I mean, India is also buying oil from Russia. I mean, all sorts of states are just not playing the game. So yes, that in that sense it has backfired. Uh, I think what I find so distressing, and they've been quite upfront about it, is that the sanctions are really have one in 10, and that's to remove Putin. Uh, that's it. Uh, and they're going to uh, punish uh, Russia uh, in their ideas to get rid of Putin. Well, it didn't work too well in Venezuela. Uh, Juan Guaido, they still, uh, you know, ridiculously call the president of, so I don't know that it's going to work. I don't think it's going to work. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and there's no going back. I mean, you, it's very hard given the kind of rhetoric and the kind of uh, policies that have been implemented against Russia to ever rebuild a relationship. But what you're seeing is the, the, the acceleration of a multipolar world. Uh, of course, the death blow, and China and Russia are acutely aware of this, is uh, destroying the SWIFT system. This is where the dollar, because the dollar is the reserve currency, largely, and because uh, the international transfer of money is through SWIFT, uh, and, they, and the U.S. controls it, this inflates the, the, the value of the dollar. If SWIFT can be replaced and the dollar is no longer the reserve currency, and of course we've seen that uh, move forward with the uh, use of the rubles, uh, not, and not just in, I think, Hungary and other countries are all paying in rubles, and isn't Germany? I think isn't there some kind of strange bank agreement or now where it, Technically, they're really paying in rubles. So, uh, 
and that's that's the death blow of the American empire. And you go back to the 1950s and you look at what happened when the pound sterling was dropped as the world's, world's reserve currency. The, the currency, not only does the currency decline in value significantly, but then nobody wants US treasury bonds. And the American empire is funded on debt. All its wars are funded on debt. Uh, and, uh, and that would see a massive contraction of the American empire, 800 military bases abroad. You just can't sustain it. Um, and, uh, and so I think that if, if you wanna be kind of very uh, uh, cynical about it, uh, in, in terms of uh, perpetuating U.S. hegemony, the policies that they have carried out towards Russia and towards China, they, they you know, that China's kind of next on the target list, uh, that has actually weakened and is weakening the American empire. One thing that we have seen recently, which is quite unusual, is Finland and Sweden sharing their plans to potentially join NATO. Is this perhaps because neutrality is no longer an option? I mean, neutrality should be the option. I mean, Ukraine should be a neutral country. Uh, it, that would make sense uh, in a geopolitical world. Uh, Russia has every reason with, for, because of historical trauma to want countries on its border to be neutral. It was invaded three times in the 20th century, World War uh, I, uh, uh, of course. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and then uh, in World War II, um, and, uh, and with two times in 20th, and then go back to the 19th with Napoleon, so three times, sorry. So there is historical trauma there, uh, which is legitimate, and, uh, uh, and that is the great tragedy. Ukraine should have, I mean, what people forget is the Ukraine had already become a de facto NATO country, given that we had, I think we had 150 military advisors in there. They were already getting significant arms before this flood of arms came in. Uh, and, uh, and that's the tragedy. It, it was unnecessary. Uh, and it would, not only was unnecessary, but for those of us who worked in Eastern Europe, it was completely predictable. Uh, and it shouldn't have happened. I mean, the real tragedy, if you go back to 89 again, is that Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and I think in the early years of Putin, they really wanted to build a kind of security alliance with Europe and the United States. Uh, they did not want to be antagonistic. Um, that era was over. Uh, but of course, if you are a militarist in the United States, you need an enemy. And if you don't have one, you'll create one. And that's kind of what happened. I do want to go back to a discussion on sanctions, which have historically been really harmful to the people in these countries who have been placed under these sanctions. It's really an act of war. But as I mentioned earlier, the sanctions coming from the EU placed onto Russia have come to the detriment of citizens within these European countries, and in Germany in particular. The price of gas and the cost to heat one's house come the winter could be extremely high. This is going to have a really negative effect on the citizens within the Eurozone. So isn't it true though that the governments, say the German government in particular, has a duty to the German people who will unfortunately be impacted by these sanctions? And why implement these sanctions just to please the United States? Well, the, we, we know what the United States is trying to do. You can't talk about war if you don't talk about markets. Uh, and uh, the United States wants Europe to buy its oil and natural gas at which prices which are going to be far higher than Russia. That, that's what's going on. Uh, and and uh, that's probably what will happen. Uh, and if the German people have to pay higher costs uh, for energy because they're buying it from the United States, that's very good for the United States, which is why they did it. Is this a sustainable model to follow? No, we're flirting with nuclear holocaust. It's, it's absolutely insane. It's as if the world is being ruled by Dr. Strangeloves. It's nuts. There's an article I wrote. I, you can go to chrisedges.substack.com. There's several articles on Ukraine and the war, but there's one called The Pimps of War. I've dealt with these people my entire career, starting in El Salvador, going through the Middle East. I covered the war in Yugoslavia. I was in Sarajevo during the war. I've dealt with them. I know these people. I actually know them personally. I mean, 
and uh, they are very, very dangerous. And un 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 unfortunately, they dominate the political uh, centers of power in both of the two ruling parties, including the Biden White House.